Well, great. Hello, everybody. It's uh, great that so many of you have been able to join us live for this uh, second in our series of mutant, mutant training sessions. And hello to those of you who are going to watch the recording in due course. So Libby, great to have Libby back with us from uh, Canada. And Libby has uh, introduced the welcome the team uh, from Dundee. I'm going to say uh, hello to everybody, not from Dundee, uh, but from Victoria Island in Lagos. So I've been in Nigeria uh, since Friday night. Uh, I've been here with the uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Dundee. It's the first time the Vice Chancellor of our university has been to Nigeria. He's had a really great couple of days giving lectures at the University of Lagos and uh, signing a really exciting uh, agreement uh, that will enable students doing master's degrees in law to split their time between the University of Lagos and the University of Dundee, part of our uh, huge commitment as an institution to Africa. I've also had some time to visit some of our partner schools. So a big shout out to everybody at Bridge House College. I was delighted to go there uh, and to, to do some mooting training uh, on Saturday. And also a big, big shout out uh, to Westerfield College. I had just gotten back, jumped out of my car just a few minutes ago. So it was great to see Mr. James uh, and the students there. So really, really big welcome to everybody. Um, look forward to a really exciting session led by Kelsey on the team. And this, in our first session, is the beginning of the introduction to mooting. Before we go to Kelsey, let me just pass back to Libby to deal with some housekeeping issues. Libby. Many thanks indeed, Prof Peter. And yes, a very, very warm welcome to you all from Dundee and from Lagos. Um, so my name is Libby Finlay. I work within the law school as a student engagement officer, and uh, all of your teachers will be receiving communications from me about the mooting competition, just to give you a little bit of my background. Uh, a few housekeeping rules today. So uh, just as Kelsey explained last week, um, we will use the Q&A function for questions. Please feel free to post your questions in there. We will answer them either via text or we will um, pose them to the panel today. You can use the chunk chat function if you want to, just to say a quick hello. Um, let us know your name and which school you're joining um, from today. But please make sure that you don't leave any personal details in either the chat function or in the Q&A. This webinar is being recorded, uh, and so we ask that you don't leave any personal details or any inappropriate comments. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand you over to Kelsey and the team for your introduction to mooting. Welcome back, guys. Um, hopefully you've had an opportunity to watch last week's lecture and kind of get a bit more um, involved in what law is and how it relates. Now. Today's lecture will be on an introduction to mooting. This, we're going to explain kind of what mooting is and how exactly the competition will be running uh, in January and in, I think it's March, yeah. Um, so this lecture is really important and I recommend that you come back to this. Uh, mooting is a very strange concept for those who have never done it before and really the best way to understand how it works is just to do it. So this lecture is just to kind of introduce you to the idea of what mooting is and what exactly the rules are. Um, I will just get the slides up. And I think Hannah will be starting us off. Hello everyone, um, we are back <clears throat> to kind of discuss and give you an introduction to mooting. So the learning aims for today, the things that we hope you kind of take from this lecture is hopefully you know who the parties are very important try it's very important in a moot to know which party you are um, understand what a bundle is and how it is created um, we will kind of list the skills that we hope you um, possess when you are mooting and they're very important we will show you how to construct strong legal arguments and kind of explain the etiquette necessary for a moot so what is mooting? So essentially mooting is a mock court appeal case. It is often competitive as in this case. So essentially what mooting is, is that you as our um, students will act as counsels um, for a case and you will be presenting your legal arguments before a judge or a panel. So those judges might be you know, us, the four of us, perhaps Professor Peter as well. Um, and you will present your submissions for each party and you will try to persuade us as your judge that your interpretation of the law is correct. Now, not only will you be presenting submissions, you may be asked questions and this is called 
judicial intervention. We will be explaining more throughout this lecture, so don't panic, but there will be um, judicial intervention. So each moot, you will be competing against another school. So you may be acting as the appellant or the respondent, and the winner will be decided on, on advocacy skills, so the way you present your legal arguments and your legal knowledge, so how you apply the cases that we have given to you to the um, present case that you're presenting to us. So the layout and the timing. Now, the order that we will be using is appellants will go first, so the senior and then the junior, followed by the respondents, so senior and then junior. Now, although um, there is senior and junior, there is no difference in timing. However, the senior appellant, as the first person to kind of present the case to the judges, will have additional responsibilities. So this might be kind of offering the facts of the case and kind of introducing to the judge um, their junior counsel, so the junior appellant and the other side. So as a senior appellant, you must remember to at least try to get your um, opponent's names. We will give them out to you in um, earlier before your moot. So just remember you need to introduce the case to the judge, offer the facts and introduce the people in the moot. Now, who are the parties? So I've kind of mentioned appellants and respondents. So appellants, as they go first, they will be kind of establishing the grounds of appeal. So this will be given in your um, case, in your problem moot. And you will kind of present to us how you think the case that was decided at the court of first instance was wrong and it should be overturned. So it's your job to kind of convince us, look, we think you should um, look, you should um, change the law. Then we've got respondents who believe in defending the decision of the court at first instance. So um, understanding the two differences, appeal, you are trying to ask the judge to overturn the previous decision. Respondents, you are defending that it was correct, what, whatever was held at the court of first instance. And then we've got a judge. So it might be a, one judge. It might be a panel of judges. We typically like to have at least two judges to kind of look over your moot. Furthermore, we will be having a clerk. Now, essentially, Clark, pronounce Clark, you will essentially be um, given times. So they are extremely important. So you need to pay attention and kind of have eye contact so that you know how many minutes um, you will be having left. So usually Libby is our clerk and she will hold a sign um, kind of telling you how many minutes you have left. So very important. So I'll just be discussing this next bit here, which is mostly just about the judge and going a bit over judicial intervention, like Hannah mentioned earlier. So the judge is the person that will be deciding the winner of the moot, um, and they have the most authority in the room. So you should try your best to always be as polite as you can and professional when you're speaking to your judge. Um, they may not have judged any of the moots so far, it might be their first one, or they might have judged quite a few. So depending on the judge, some might ask you for more facts and others would prefer to you, for you to just go straight onto the law. Um, and you should kind of see as they're progressing, so see if they're nodding along with you or if they look a lot confused, you can always pause and kind of ask them if they need any clarification on your argument. So the best thing to do always at the start of a moot is to briefly offer to discuss the facts for the judge in case they haven't heard um, this moot before yet. And if one of your counsel has already offered the facts before, you can assume that they're familiar and that you can just proceed on with your argument on the law. So here we've done a couple of examples about the best way to address the judge in a moot because it's definitely going to be a new style of talking if you've never done a moot before. It certainly was for me. Um, so when you're talking to the judge, you refer to them as my lord or my lady or your lordship or your ladyship during your submission. And you use the my or the your in different circumstances. So generally what we'd say is if you were going to say you, 
you would say your lordship or your ladyship. So it'd be if I could direct your ladyship to page six of the judgment pack. Um, and then if it's something that's specifically to do with your argument, like a point that you are wanting to emphasize, you would say my. So you'd say, my lord, the submission of the appellants relates to such and such. And I always tend to have that kind of at the top of my flashcards just so that I'm consistent in referring to the judge correctly. And if you're not too sure, you can always ask at the beginning of the moot. Um, it's quite important to never interrupt the judge if they might be asking you a question or um, kind of seeking clarification on your argument. Try and wait for them to finish before answering their question. So we've made a couple of examples here based on what the uh, best way would be to talk to a judge and what maybe the not so quite polite way would be to speak to a judge. So um, I will read out these examples one at a time. Feel free any of you to pop in the chat whether you think that any of these can be improved or whether they're more right. So the first one would be, my lady, please turn to page four of the bundle to see the relevant sections of the legislation highlighted in yellow. And then the second one is, the people over there have said that this law does not apply, but it does. The third one is, your honor, what you're saying is ridiculous. The fourth one, if it pleases the court, I wish to direct your lordship to the following case. And finally, the fifth, I think everyone should look at this law. So if any of you are feeling particularly brave, feel free to pop your mic on and kind of indicate which ones you think would be the best ones to use in a moot or even pop it in the chat. Yeah, if you just um, want to we'll be going through. If you just want to put in the chat, maybe kind of one or two or three and just the number and say whether you think it's appropriate or not appropriate. Um, and you don't have to answer all of them. Just any if you think you can. Um, some of them, I think, are a bit more easier than others. Yeah, perfect. So we've got already someone in the chat here that's saying that the first one and the fourth one here would be the most appropriate. And that's that's definitely correct. Those two are the ones that are um, have the best way to address the judge with my lady or your lordship and also uses good formal court language which we'll be speaking on a bit later on about court etiquette as well can i just pop in so, and say why why is your honor not not correct because that's something you hear on television quite a lot isn't it yeah definitely um so your honor is would be correct if you were in america um, just because that's the way that they do refer to the judges there. So that would be correct there. But because we're using an English court system, it's always going to be my lady or my lord and your lordship or your ladyship. And that's always the best way to refer to a judge. Yeah. And I can see I can just jump in another Peter. clarification. So th there is one English court where you would say your honour, uh, and that is in a county court. Um, and that that's sort of a the, the standard court would he, which hears most um, middle ranking uh, civil cases. So in a county court, you would say your honor, uh, but in the court of appeal and the high court, you say my lord, uh, my lady, and we are dealing with appeals. So we are in the court of appeal. So it is my lord or my lady. So we've picked out a couple of examples here of the ones that might not be um, always a correct way to address either the judge or your opponents. So in the second one, the better way to state that maybe what the other side have said might not be correct would be my learned friends from across the bar have submitted that this area of law is inapplicable. I submit to your lordship that um, ours would be more applicable or something such as this would be a better way of saying it because you can always say that the other side's law is not as good of an argument as yours you're allowed to you're allowed to kind of make that point but you just have to still do it with quite a lot of respect because we're in a formal setting so for the second one your honor what you're saying is ridiculous that's kind of more to do with just because we're meant to always be the most respectful that you can be to the judge and you can respectfully disagree with them and just say my lady, I respectfully submit that this line of reasoning does not apply here. If they were to ask you a question, say, well, what do you think about this? 
you'd then say, I submit that that line of reasoning does or does not apply here. And that's still showing them respect. And then finally, I think everyone should look at this law. The better way to state that would be, if it pleases your ladyship, I'll direct the court to the following piece of legislation found in the, you guys will have judgment packs rather than bundles. So found in the judgment pack at page six. So just to touch on judicial intervention here, um, I remember Hannah mentioning that at the start of the lecture, and that is when during your submission, the judge will stop and ask you questions. They tend to usually be quite simple questions such as what court your cases were heard in, um, if they have precedent over the moot problem, uh, or if they're wanting you to kind of clarify your argument, or they might ask for you to expand a little bit more on a point you've made. And if your submission's going well, the judges will usually ask you, ask you more questions about your argument to see how well you've looked at that particular case. And it's okay if you're not sure what's being asked for you to always ask the judge to rephrase the question. Um, so you could say, my lady, would it be possible for you to rephrase the question? And they'll try and put it to you in a different way so that you're able to answer it. Uh, it's really important never to argue with the judge or show that you're frustrated that they've interrupted you in the middle of your argument because I know sometimes you could be in the flow of your argument and then the judge interrupts and, and asks you a question that it can be frustrating but it's always best to kind of take that question in your stride and use it to show that you understand the law and to help clarify the law for your judge. Hi, so I'll talk more about etiquette, about marking and about the research. So first we'll talk about etiquette. And I think there are three main things. So the first one is that your language is very formal. So you're addressing your leadership, your lordship, my lord, my lady. Um, you're not using slang. So it's quite a formal English. Another thing is that it is important to be respectful. Everyone is in the same position as you. You may be quite nervous. Your opposing counsels, your friends may be quite nervous. I'm more than sure that judges most of the times are quite nervous. So we want to be respectful. And for example, when you're addressing your friends, you're not just saying, yeah, as Ria mentioned, those guys over there were saying my learned friends or my learned colleagues. And in this respectful way, we also try to rebut their argument. In terms of language, it is also important that we're using certain language so that we sound quite sure about the argument we're making. We're not just saying, I believe or I think, because that in a way diminishes your argument. You don't, you don't sound sure about what you're saying. So it's always a better option to say, I submit or I argue instead. So now to talk a little bit about marking. Uh, it is important the way you analyze the law and your legal knowledge, but the marking also depends on the structure of your argument, for example the way your argument flows, that you're not dumping from one case to another, so you make sure it is coherent. What also is important is your oral representation, how you speak. It's always a better idea to slow down. Uh, we might be nervous, you might want to speak slowly, it happens all the time, but it's better just to take a deep breath and go a little bit slower. Uh, another factor is teamwork. So when you're preparing for your moot, it doesn't mean that you have to write your speeches together, you have to do the research together, but it is always a good idea to meet up, to identify your arguments and to kind of split them. In this case also, you have the same amount of time, so seven minutes for both of you on the same team. And it is just a good way to split your arguments uh, so that your argument is coherent, you're not repeating each other and you're not contradicting each other as well. Uh, relevant authorities, again, we're using cases and legislation. You will be given uh, textbooks. Uh, it is better to use cases and legislation. Of course, you read the material, you read your books, but you don't refer to them. Uh, then again, speaking skills and etiquette. So you, you have to be quite formal. Uh, responses to the question, as Ria mentioned, uh, 
you don't interrupt the judge. Uh, maybe when they finish their question, you might ask them to rephrase it. If you don't, if you're not quite sure about the answer to the question, you might just take a minute to think and then give the answer. You don't have to fire back at the same second they finished. Uh, effectiveness of rebuttals so that you anticipate where other side might argue and that you also finish your uh, speech, your submission in time. Uh, so another point is that you might win on the point of law, but at the same time, you might lose the moot. So again, going back to what I said, it's not only the analysis of law and legal knowledge, but it is also the way you present your argument. You might have maybe a weaker side of law that you're on, but at the same time, your argument was so good, it was structured in a really good way. You spoke confidently. So in this way, you might win the moot, but lose on the law. Um, so the bundle is the is like a collection of documents that you will be using. So it usually has a front page with the name of the court on it, with the name of councils and the name of the case. It might also have a skeleton argument. So this is just a very simplified uh, argument. So you might just say, first, we're gonna argue on this point and use this authority. Next, we're gonna argue on the second point and use another authority. So it's just a very simplified argument that you're making. Um, for the purposes of this competition, you will refer to the judgment pack. This will be your bundle. And during your speech, you will direct the judge to the sections of the bundle. So you might uh, say, if I could please direct the lordship or your leadership to the page five of the bundle, for example. You should also make it clear uh, in your speech to which page you are directing the judge. And to speak a little bit about terminology, we spoke about what moot is. Is it mock appellate trial on a point of law? I think it's important to note here that it's an appellate trial. So what I've done in my first year, I've been reading the moot problem and I was focusing a lot on the facts of the case, like that doesn't seem right. But because it is an appellate case, we don't have to think about the facts. Facts are already certain and we need to discuss the points of law. So authorities, as we mentioned, uh, cases and legislation are our primary authorities, and it is always better to use primary authorities than secondary, than books, for example, or articles. It is better to refer to your primary authorities. So rebuttal is uh, you anticipating what your opposing counsels might argue, and in respectful way, try to diminish their arguments. So you might say, my learned friends across the bar might argue this and this and this, but in, and you continue your argument saying that your point of view in this case is a better one, but in a respectful way, of course. So councils are barristers acting in a moot. Bundle, we talked about the bundle, it's a prepared document folder of authorities that you're using with relevant highlighted sections. So, Appellant is an appealing party who is arguing that the decision should be overturned and the respondents are arguing that the uh, judge in first instance was correct. So just jump to judge at first instance is the judge that decided the initial decision. So the first judge that ever heard the case. And submission is the speech that you're um, giving in to the judge in the, in the moot. Okay, so now we're just going to cover um, last week's questions. Um, but just before, um, I don't know if you guys saw, I got a notification from Libby asking about the order. So we might have had a small error. We will be using um, a different order than the one that was on the slides. And we will make sure to correct the slides before they are sent out. And that we will also email kind of a proper list of instructions about the rules of the competition um, before the actual competition. Um, but we'll just keep repeating it. So we're actually going to use the order will be junior appellant, junior respondent, senior appellant, senior respondent. Everyone will still have seven minutes, um, but everything Hannah spoke about in terms of who's going to introduce the court um, to all the names of counsel and the facts of the case will actually be the junior appellant. But again, we will... 
edit the slides um, to make sure that everyone knows that and apologize um, for the inconvenience uh, and kind of any misinformation that was spread. Um, it's just because um, we, I think we initially planned to use the English version, but the Scottish way of doing it, that order mixing between appellants and respondents allows for um, better rebuttal so that people can hear. Um, we've got a question um, in the Q&A as well about where will the moot take place in Kenya? Um, so I'm not sure if Peter is planning on going to Kenya, but the competitions will primarily be online um, through Zoom and it'll just be whoever the appellants and respondents are plus us. Um, so no one else will get to watch everyone else competing. Um, and I'm not sure if we're recording them. I don't think we are. No, I don't think so. Um, so yes, unless Peter's planning on going there, they will be online and we will circulate links for people to attend. Um, so unless I've missed anything else out, we can go on to the answers from last week's questions. So if anyone... Just, just a, a short yeah. one. I, I will maybe be able to visit some of the schools to to, to do the internal competition um, face to face, um, but I can't give, say, definitely just yet so it dep depends on planning uh, uh but hopefully by december i should know when i'm next going to be in the different countries so i do hope to get to both east africa uh, and west africa in the first part of 2024 uh, and if it if that is early enough and that coincides with schools being in session then it might be possible to do some face-to-face -face internal competitions which i think everybody re really really excited about and particularly me Thanks, Kelsey. No problem. Um, so, yes, if anyone's feeling brave enough, they can put in the chat or raise their hand about some of these questions. So the first one is, what is judicial precedent? And um, if you remember, we spoke about it last week and kind of it's, I guess, the cornerstone of any common law system, which England is. So does anyone kind of want to give me a brief definition of what judicial precedent is? Doesn't need to be super detailed or they can put their hand up. Hey, okay, someone's raised their hand. I'm not sure if you're able to turn your mic on. Students should be able to, right Libby? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I can. Um, judicial precedent, I believe it's uh, past decisions made by past law lawyers, uh, past judges that are um, that are applied to current cases. So yeah, past decisions made by past judges that are used as uh, decisions for current cases. And yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think the one thing to emphasize there is a perfect answer. Past decisions. And um, the important thing is that they're binding um, if they come from a higher court. So I think there's an answer here. Judges must follow previous decisions of cases where the facts are sufficiently similar um, and they have to apply the decisions of higher courts. For example, um, the Court of Appeal will have to follow the decision that has been made by the Supreme Court because it's a higher case uh, with more authority, a higher court with more authority, sorry. Um, but in limited circumstances, judges in lower courts can depart from a higher, a higher court's decision if they can distinguish them on the facts. Um, but yes, thank you so much, um, Wema, for, for volunteering an answer. And so we've got a second one about what is a law report? I'm not sure if we covered this, last week but has anyone had a google um, and found out what a law report is if you're not sure don't worry just say um, and i can explain it Nobody's feeling brave or nobody knows what they are. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, Peter, you're on mute. Is there anybody from Bridge House College uh, on the uh, call? Because they should certainly know about law reports because we spent a bit of time going <laughs> through a law report on Saturday morning. There's a couple uh, answers in the Q&A uh, that says the doctrine of precedent, so where all previous precedent is. And someone else said a law report is a published record of judicial decision. Um, and someone else has raised their hand. So if they want to come on and say what they think it is. I can't see who's raised a hand, actually. It it was coming up and down, so I'm not sure. Ah. Go on, be brave. We won't <laughs> shy it. Oh, and gets come back again. Law report is an official record of law cases, legal cases that help lawyers decide on a particular course of action. Yeah, perfect. Thank you That's so much. That's great. Are, are you, which school are you from? GC Academy. GC, okay, that's great. Hope to see you next time I'm over. I like um, your use of the word official. That's really important because um, usually law reports are published in kind of certain certified official journals that carry a lot of authority um, and make sure that it's been recorded accurately. So we've got another answer from someone in the chat saying a record of judicial decision on a point of law which sets a precedent. Um, now, the law report, um, so what we said so far is correct. Uh, it's a record of a judicial decision um, and includes the submissions of um, another thing is it's not just the judgment. It also includes the submissions of either the pursuer or the defender or the appellant or the respondent, whoever the parties are, um, as well as maybe the facts of the case and the discussion that's had before the judgment is actually set out. So it's really important that not necessarily when you're voting, because we've given you quotes from the judge, but when we do it at university, um, we have had some people using quotes from counsel, which is not a legal source, only um, things said by the judge within their judgment are legal sources. So yeah, it's important to kind of recognize that a law report is not just the judge's decision. But, but certainly when you're preparing for the internal competition, and even more so when you're preparing uh, for the international competition. Once you've gone through the judgments pack, if you want to get a bit more context, then we would encourage you to look at the full text of the judgments. Now, I know when you, you and this is what we did at Bridge House on Saturday, when you look at the full judgment, you think, wow, this is such a big, big document. Um, I'm never going to be able to read this. And it's true. It is a big document. One of the things that you learn uh, at, a law, at your law degree here at Dundee Law School is the ability to be able to read a judgment quickly to identify what's important, what is less important. And one of the great top tips, and especially something we would encourage you to do, is to look at the first couple of pages. In the first two pages of, of any uh, official law report, uh, you will see what is called a headnote. The headnote is not part of the judgment itself. It's a summary provided by the editors of the law report. Uh, but it's usually a very accurate summary. It details the facts uh, in, in quite a lot of detail. And crucially, it goes through the legal reasoning adopted by the court and identifies what's their issue uh, and what is over there. We're going to come to those terms in a, a bit later. Um, but yeah, look at the head note, and that might help you to give a, a leg up to identify which pages of the actual judgment it's worth having a little look at. So lots of techniques to, to be able to process judgments uh, quickly and efficiently. Yeah, if it's beneficial, we can have a look through some judgments in the workshops, um, if that's helpful to anyone, and just kind of talk about that. Um, okay, so next question is, how important are cases as a source of law, and are some cases more important than others? Um, now, this is quite a wide question, so if anyone just wants to share their thoughts um, about sources of law, we had a couple, um, there was kind of some controversy last week with the common law system and whether judges have too much flexibility for changing the law. So now's, now's everyone's moment to, to share their opinion.
Okay, I'm not sure if people are typing or still thinking. Um, but we have got um, only maybe 20 more minutes left of today's lecture and a few more questions to get through. So I'll just share the answer, um, which is the fact that because of judicial precedent, as we discussed, some cases are more important if they were heard in higher courts. For example, UK Supreme Court, which is UKSC, or UKHL, which means the UK House of Lords, which was kind of the previous court that was in place before the Supreme Court came in. Um, and then also certain areas of law have very important cases. For example, Donahue and Stevenson that we talked about last week is a really important case in terms of negligence, um, but it's not considered uh, a very important case, for example, in let me try, like a contract, really. Um, so it's all about looking at certain areas of law will have very important cases that just relate to them. And um, so that's what we're trying to get at. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Donahue and Stevenson, if anyone's had a chance to look at this case. So we've just got some questions here um, about what were the facts, what was the outcome, what was the ratio decidendi, and do you agree with the outcome? So if anyone just wants to put in the chat and answers any of these questions, that's fine, um, or they can put their hand up and answer them over the microphone. It's quite an interesting case. Everyone at Dundee learns about this case. I think every law student learns about this case um, in first year. Really, really important. Case. Maybe we should share the uh, the fantastic video that was made about the case, Kelsey. I was, thinking, oh, yeah. I was thinking exactly the same thing, actually. So, so when you, for those of you who do come to Dundee Law School, one of the lecturers who teaches some of the first year courses in the English LLB it has got a real, real expertise in making videos. And he, since he's joined us, he's made some videos and uh, a really fantastic one uh, that has some really brilliant acting in it um, is about the Donahue and Stevenson case. It's a really mean judge, though. So I'm not sure if maybe people are a bit more shy or didn't have a chance to look at this case. So, so I think some of the schools that the, where the students actually study law, they, they may have come across this case. It's a case, uh, possibly it won't make easy reading if you like ginger beer. <laughs> Did it not uh, celebrate a, a milestone birthday relatively recently? Yeah. Okay, we've got someone in the Q&A who said a woman found snail pieces in her ginger beer and suffered from nervous shock as when she was pouring out, she saw the snail pieces in the beer. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I think, yeah, it was a snail. Um, yeah, and she drank a bit. So she also said she had some gastrointestinal issues as well. And essentially the problem was she, I think it was her friend that bought the ginger beer and she drank it. Um, and it was whether or not she was owed a duty of care um, because she wasn't actually a party to any implied contract. Um, so, yeah, Mrs. Donahue found a dead snail in her ginger beer um, and her friend bought it for her. So she was not able to claim through breach of warranty of contract as she was not a party to the contract. And the outcome of the case that she was actually awarded damages. Um, this case went all the way to the UK Supreme Court. Um, so it's a very authoritative case. And the ratio decidendi, which was a definition we talked about last week, which basically means the reason for the decision, the judicial decision, is that negligence is distinct and separate in tort, uh, which is an area of English law we talked about in terms of duties. Um, there does not need to be a contractual relationship for a duty to be established and manufacturers owe a duty of care to the consumers who intend to use their product. Um, and this was what is now called the neighborhood principle or the neighbor principle. Um, Ria wants to add something. I just wanted to say that I, I can't remember if we had Ratio Decidendi in our first PowerPoint. I think we did. I think we did. But just, just in case anyone hasn't had a chance to look at it yet, that's like the main principle that would come out of a case. So for this one, it's the most important principle that the judges had in, in their judgment. 
Yep. I think we had Ratio Dissidendi and Stare Decisis as well. So if you're not sure what those are, go back and look at lecture one. Um, but yeah, they just mean kind of the reason for the decision. And then Stare Decisis is, I think, discussion that's not actually part of the decision. So, and here we've just got the quote from the, I think it must have been, was it Lord Atkin? He's the main guy. Um, which says that who then in law is my neighbor? The answer seems to be persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I'm directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called into question. And um, so this is a very broad principle, the neighbor principle. And that's what makes it so beneficial in moot problems is you can argue it kind of either way, which is why this case is so important. And we've just got a question about, do you agree with the outcome and what implications could this have? Um, and kind of the the worry is, where does it end? Um, and who isn't in contemplation? So the fact is people could bring claims for damages against all other types of people, as long as their acts were kind of closely enough connected to bring a claim in negligence, or there was kind of a tenuous relationship that could establish a duty of care. Um, and then just the last question we've got is how many judges are currently sitting in the UK Supreme Court? This hopefully is an easy one. <laughs> Someone said 12. Does anyone disagree? No one else. Yes, 12 is correct. There are only 12 justices in the UK Supreme Court and not all of them sit at the same time. I think five is maybe the most amount of judges you can get in a case. Um, and they usually sit in threes, I think. Um, it's always important that they sit in a panel that has an odd number to make sure that there's never um, a chance where there's kind of no majority. Um, you, you, you can't you can't have more sitting if it's a case of exceptional importance. Interesting. Um, and fun fact uh, is that a couple of students from the University of Dundee have actually had the opportunity to go to the Supreme Court uh, as part of our internal competition that we run here with our University of Dundee students. And we were able, uh, Rio was one of those competitors, and we were able to have Lord Hodge um, oversee our um, kind of a wee moot competition. And it was really good because he is a Scottish, one of the, I think he was one of the two Scottish justices in the UK Supreme Court at the time. And um, so that was really exciting. So who knows, if you come to Dundee, you might be able to go to the Supreme Court and actually be judged by justice. Um, but that brings us to the end of our presentation today. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand and ask us. Alternatively, we have, I think a lot of people are now on the WhatsApp group. So don't be afraid to ask questions in there as well. Um, Quick note to say that I will send on a, a reminder of, of how to join the WhatsApp group um, to all your teachers uh, when I send on the recording uh, and the presentation for this for this session. So if you're not yet on the WhatsApp group, please do um, ask them. I'm not going to put the link up in 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 the chat here um, because it is just for students who are doing the routine competition. I don't want it spread uh, outside this this group. Um, but please do ask questions if you have any. Now is a good yeah. time. We had a question about um, where are the slides being sent? So I think they're being sent to your teachers. Um, Absolutely. And so I, I've sent on all the presentation. I sent on the presentation from last week and I'll send the presentation alongside the recording this week, um, along with the link to next week's webinar as well. They're going in the, we're putting them in the WhatsApp group as well. So yes. if you are comfortable being in there, um, it's just a good chance to get access to the materials if it takes a while for your teachers to pass them on. Um, 
I feel like I had something to say, but now I can't remember what it was. Oh, yes. Uh, um, ne- yeah, next week's will be on, um, I think the next two lectures we've got will be on some more of the um, marking criteria that Rihanna talked about. So we're really going to go in depth and explain kind of what those mean, how to make sure your oral presentation and your structure is clear um, and formal and concise, and also how to put together a legal argument and read the judgment pack and read judgments and make sure that your cases are authoritative. Um, So we will be going over in more detail the marking scheme. Um, And I think the next one might be on oral presentation, if I'm not wrong. I can't remember. I can't remember, but I'm going to have a look. But I will also add some links to um, YouTube videos that we have. So uh, the, an earlier team recorded uh, a, a sort of mock moot for you to all have a look at. Now, please disregard the order of that moot because it's a slightly different order to the order that you'll be mooting um, in. But it's really useful to see the etiquette that's used, the way in which uh, the students are addressing each other and addressing the judge. Um, so I'll add that and I'll also see if I'm allowed to add the uh, video that uh, Mr. Simmons has, has done um, as well. There's some cameo performances. <laughs> so I'm just going to put in the chat. Um one case where the Supreme Court did sit uh, with all the members, that was the uh, the Brexit case, the case involving Mrs. Miller, uh, and all the judges of the Supreme Court um, were involved in that. And that was because of the, the, the huge constitutional significance for the United Kingdom. Um, but that really is very, very, very unusual. Great. So if there are no more questions, uh, or comments that that's great then we're going to wrap up our second uh, workshop so big big thanks to, to kelsey and all the team and to you for joining us uh, and for those of you who are watching the recording uh feel free to get your teachers to send an email if you've got any questions so uh, it's great to see such engagement um and it's been wonderful for me this week to sort of get to meet some more of the mooters uh, on the ground here in lagos nigeria uh, back i won't be here next week uh, but Libby, Kelsey and the team uh, will be uh, delivering the, the third seminar uh, and I'll see you in two weeks time. So all the best from Lagos and all the best from Dundee. <laughs> from Dundee. Brilliant. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Thank you.